Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, lawmakers consider protections amid the increasing use of aerial drones. Plus, experts offer tips on appearing before a committee and another look at one of the beautiful features of the Minnesota State Capitol. All of this next on Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. The use of aerial drones is becoming a more popular and practical tool in both the private and public sectors. State lawmakers recently met to review whether Minnesotans' privacy is adequately protected with the increasing use of these tools. Drones are new and powerful tools, and in working with law enforcement to craft exceptions in this bill, we've acknowledged the real-world real benefits of drone usage. However, drones are also unique in their potential for secret surveillance. Unlike other police vehicles such as helicopters or even stationary cameras, drones are very cheap, they're small, they're highly mobile, and they're quiet. And while there may not be a full expectation of privacy in public places, this does not mean that somebody going out into public is consent to pervasive, warrantless government surveillance. If law enforcement had a reasonable suspicion that something might be beyond a tree line and from a road or a public accommodation you couldn't see back there, uh, what is the role of, of uh, law enforcement when they're faced with that type of situation? If you launched it from a public road, for example, and were able to see the area that's not up adjacent to the house, you would be able to utilize um, the open fields doctrine to, to observe that. However, if I'm using technology on that drone, for example, a telephoto lens to look into that area, even though I'm out on the road, and I'm using something enhancing my natural senses beyond where I'd be able to normally see, I would then need to get a search warrant to um, observe that area. We have a fatal car crash at a major intersection in the county, let's just say Highway 42 and Cedar, which is, that, that, you lock up that intersection, you got people backed up for miles. If you can get that drone out there to photo, uh, photograph that crime scene, the, the, the crash scene, you, you may be able to open that up faster. It's a wide variety of circumstances in which we deploy the drone. As the sheriff said, we've on three or four occasions with natural disasters, have deployed the drone. We also have had occasion where people are, are fleeing into fields, that type of thing. Uh, we will try to uh, apprehend that person with the help of the drone. And we seem to have been maybe more successful than Sheriff Lesh, but uh, <laughs> it has been an effective tool for us. Um, the other thing is people in crisis. When people are in crisis, sometimes they, they run and they run away from people, they run away from us, and we've used it about a half dozen occasions in that regard. Matter of fact, in the last week, we've had two occasions where that's occurred. Uh, where one was a young man, an adolescent, who ran from home with threatening suicide, and we deployed the drone into a wood line to try to locate him uh, for his parents, try to, to get him to safety. Can you think of a scenario where you would need to employ a UAV in a certain fashion uh, that this bill wouldn't let you do? I have, a, I have one area that potentially be a concern. I, I can't remember where it is. And somewhere in the language, it's, it uses the word significant when it comes to a public event. And what does the term significant mean? Mm -hmm. If we have a lost child at a public event, um, is that significant or not? Um, and so where does, that, where does that define? And I think it's important, as you had a prior discussion with the superintendent, to make that language as clear as possible, and it's not always easy to do so. Joining me now in the studio is the chair of the Senate Judiciary and Public Safety Committee, who has been actively involved in data privacy issues, Senator Warren Limmer. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So as the use of aerial drones is becoming a more popular and practical tool, both in the private and the public sectors, is the use of drones encroaching on a person's right to privacy? Possibly. Uh, as you know, we have civil liberties that protect our uh, rights. It protects the government from intruding in our life unnecessarily, and they have certain requirements that they have to satisfy in order to invade our life. Uh, some of that is dictated by probable cause in the event that you committed a crime and they, law enforcement thinks 
a crime was committed and you're the target of that suspicion, they can get a warrant. But uh, drones are a little different, uh, similar to, let's say, a police officer walking on a sidewalk and he just looks over your front yard and he sees you do something, something that's wrong or illegal. He doesn't need a warrant to observe and gather that fact. Uh, a drone is a little different. It gives you high-tech eyes. It can go up over a tree line and peer over. Um, under current case law, that is legal for a law enforcement to conduct that type of a search. Now, if there is something, if, if uh, law enforcement went across a farmer's field and then went into a barn or up close to a barn to look inside, let's say there's a stolen semi-truck in that barn, then a warrant would be necessary. So there are limitations and it's kind of subjective, but once you cross that line, it, it uh, really triggers a stern response from the courts. Well, it does sound like there is a gray area. And so are there already laws on the books? I mean, you've sort of said there are, but like trespassing. I mean, can a drone trespass to protect, um, or if it does trespass, is whatever is found? And then what are the implications if it's public or private? I mean, this is a, this is a gray area. It is. And uh, the way I was told by the Bureau of, of Criminal Apprehension is that there's a doctrine called open fields doctrine, that a drone not to mention a law enforcement agent could walk across your back 40 acres to see if there's any wrongdoing there, if there's reasonable suspicion. But if they have to look inside, if they have to go to your residence or what they call the curtilage, that's the immediate area around your property, then they would need uh, probable cause in order to get a warrant. Okay, so let's say public officials are using a drone, law enforcement are using a drone to survey storm damage, which is common right now, and they happen to discover a field of marijuana growing. What can they use that information? They could use that information, bring that information to a judge, ask for uh, a warrant to be issued because now they suspect prob there's probable cause satisfied that a crime is being committed and the owner of that property is the one committing it and a judge would most certainly sign a search warrant for it. Well, we heard testimony today from the ACLU that the use of drones may be a threat to constitutional rights because it's a unique technology in terms of its ability to do secret surveillance. There's a fear that the police could indiscriminately snoop on law-abiding people. What are your thoughts about this concern? Yeah, that's always a concern of ours as well. And with increased technology, the technology that makes whatever records the information, it's getting smaller, it's getting more sophisticated. I've even seen in catalogs where a camera lens is, it looks like the nail head, a nail head on a wall. And that could be a camera looking at whoever it is that they're the subject of. Uh, that changes the dynamic a little bit because now the subject has no clue that they're being watched there's no suspicion that even a drone would be up in the sky now, and then it's even closer uh, to the subject and their personal residence. So you better have a good reason, and you have to justify that reason to a court in order to get a warrant. I think there are times, if we did not set up proper parameters of play for law enforcement to record data on individual citizens, one civil liberties could be abused. And that's why we're studying this issue during this interim. Well, the bill that passed the legislature last session with bipartisan support would have required that law enforcement uh, obtain a warrant to use a drone with uh, exceptions, which are for the training of officers or emergencies or you know, uh, mm -hmm. natural disasters, public events. It did not become law. A representative of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension said that current law already governs the use of drones does the law need to specify the use of drones, or is he right that there's already enough in the law? Well, the superintendent of criminal apprehension, uh, that's his opinion. But we're not just going to rely on one opinion. We're going to ferret out this issue. We're going to come to our own conclusions. We're the ones that write, <clears throat> we're the ones that write policy for the state of Minnesota, not the superintendent of Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. But we want to make sure that we're, we're within the parameters of larger case law that's already 
establishing the parameters of play. Um, I believe that the superintendent wants to make sure that he has the opportunity to gather evidence on suspicious activity that could lead to an arrest. Uh, if he happened to gather information that never came to an arrest, our proposal says you've got to get rid of that information. You can't stockpile it. You can't gather huge dossiers on individual citizens. You've got to wipe that information out within seven days. I think that's, that's wise. I think that's uh, a balanced approach. And whenever we're dealing with data privacy, it's always a, a balance that we want between public good and individual freedoms and rights. And there's a balance there that we have to always try to find the proper point. So public safety is very important to you. What are you hearing from law enforcement across the board? Well, I think in the area of drones, uh, they realize that uh, the areas of drug enforcement, traffic enforcement, gathering uh, information over, let's say, uh, uh, a fatal car accident scene, maybe not criminal activity, but a traffic-related accident, they need something to give context to their investigation. Oftentimes, that context is gathered by a picture from a height that can see the whole picture, maybe the skid marks, maybe uh, an obstacle in the way that can clearly state why an accident happened or how can we prevent that in the future. I think drones are very useful. They're useful in the terms of agriculture, searching for lost people. Let's say a person wanders away from a nursing home or a young child walks along a dike or a or a swamp area, a drone becomes very, very effective in going over a large amount of space in a very short time. And also they have infrared capabilities so they can pick up heat signatures when it's cooler weather out. And we know Minnesota has plenty of that. And so uh, it's very useful. We just want to make sure. And you don't need to have a, a, a search warrant in a time of an emergency like that. Mm -hmm. Definitions of emergency, definitions of substantial risk to the public, all need to be defined. And our bill didn't have that. So once that was pointed out to us this last year, we paused, we pulled back, and now we're doing a little more research to make sure we write a very good law that creates that balance that I talked about. Well, and potentially one emerging issue, technology changes so quickly, and now there are significant advances in facial recognition software mm -hmm. and biometric matching technology, which can, which can be added to these drones. What are the implications of technology moving even more quickly than our laws can keep up? Technology has been moving faster than state governments and even the federal government faster than we can ever catch up to. Quantum leaps uh, in technology is causing us to be the tortoise versus the hare in the race and that hair is not slowing down at all. And so uh, that's why we have meetings during the interim catching us up in our commission on data practices so we can keep up with that emerging issues that are constant before us. And we're still trying to just gasping uh, in order to keep up with it. But it's necessary, this issue is not going away, it's increasing and it's challenging us on public policy every year. Senator Limmer, thank you so much for your time. You Each year, state fairgoers are asked to take an opinion poll on pressing state issues. Questions are developed from among the numerous bills proposed by lawmakers and represent pressing issues and concerns that remain unresolved. You'll find the Minnesota Senate booth and the House of Representatives booth inside the Education Building on Cosgrove Street at the State Fairgrounds. In addition to making your views known by taking the separate polls offered by the Senate and the House, you may have the opportunity to visit with one or more lawmakers frequently on hand to listen to the concerns of fairgoers. The Education Building also houses booths of some of Minnesota's nonprofit and educational institutions offers robotics demonstrations by middle and high school students, and displays art, writing, and craft projects demonstrating the work of some of Minnesota's most talented kids. If you happen to find yourself at the Great Minnesota Get-Together this summer, 
Don't forget to stop by the Minnesota Senate booth in the Education Building to provide your perspective on this year's State Fair Opinion Poll. Appearing before a legislative committee may be intimidating, but it does offer Minnesotans the opportunity to weigh in on pressing state issues. In our occasional series, The Elements of Democracy, we asked policymakers for helpful tips in conveying one's viewpoint effectively. The committee process is a primary step in developing and passing legislation at the state capitol. Those who testify during a committee meeting can play a significant role in determining the outcome of that legislation. Often those who testify are government officials or lobbyists, but the voice of the public is also a key element in the committee process. I think public testimony is really important um, for a number of reasons. Legislators simply cannot be experts on all topics. We usually have 3,000 bills that get introduced in a legislative session um, on a lot of different topics and they may serve on four or five committees so it's really hard for them to become experts in every single topic. So I do think that public testimony provides an opportunity for them to hear a perspective that they may not have thought of. The personal experiences of individual citizens brings important and valuable testimony to the process, providing lawmakers with another point of view to consider when debating legislation. We know every bill has an impact on people's lives. What we want to hear is how does, how does that person testifying and addressing the Senate feel about that bill? How would it affect their lives? What is the story behind it? Stories are really powerful in moving legislators and, and helping to form an opinion. Um, and it's a great way for us to see a real world application of some of the things that, of, of the issues we're addressing. It is those human stories more than anything that absolutely touches legislators. When somebody comes in and really connects, really connects with us and tells us how something has affected their lives and their families and their communities, it absolutely makes a difference. Personal experience is one way to have an impact at the Capitol. Being well organized and keeping statements brief are others. On any given day, legislators sit through numerous committees, wade through pages of data, and listen to hours of testimony. Using time wisely is key to committee testimony. There are two items in the direct care and treatment services area that I would like to specifically mention. The first is the child and adolescent I have kind of three uh, little quick services. rules that I try to follow. Keep it simple, keep it short, keep it focused. Um, legislators, you have to respect their time. Um, there's usually a dozen or two dozen people waiting in line to testify on given bills. So your testimony really needs to be at a pretty fast clip pace. I try to keep testimony usually at uh, two to three minutes. I try to get to the important things right up front. I usually try to focus on just two to three points because if it gets much more than that, then you're diluting what message you're trying to convey. Keep a presentation around two to three minutes, if you can. That leaves a little time for senators to ask questions if there are questions. Um, make sure that you're prepared. You know what you're gonna talk about. Don't just come up and, and uh, wing it, so to speak. Credibility is the currency in which legislators and professional and citizen lobbyists deal. Truthful information is any testifier's best friend. It is the foundation for the laws that are passed at the Capitol. Being forthright, credible, and respectful are, are the cornerstones of great testimony. Um, we base our, our decisions ba on, on the information that is being presented in these, in these hearings. So to be credible is extremely important. The whole testimony process, really, you're not sworn in, it's not a court of law, but it is based on a trust system that you are telling the truth when you testify. It's important for a lobbyist never to bluff, never to provide false information. They don't want to exaggerate or extend the circumstances that may have happened to them. Just be specific and if there is a question that they can't answer, they can offer to get back to a legislator as well. Participation in the legislative process takes many forms. Meeting and corresponding with lawmakers are common methods. Committee testimony is another one where lawmakers welcome and encourage public participation. 
I think we all have that image from congressional testimony where someone stands up and holds up their right hand and there are all the photographers sitting in front of them. It is nothing like that in the Minnesota <laughs> legislature. Um, you know, it, you'll have a couple of people sitting at the, at the testifier's table and you'll have a, a, a line of senators or representatives just there just to just sort of listen and then there'll be maybe a little dialogue after the fact. But the whole point is to welcome people into this process. I'm a mother of three, I'm a housewife. Uh, legislators are very respectful for people who are testifying for the first time. Um, it is a, think of it as just communicating with 10 people, try to block out all the other people in the room. You truly are the expert at your story. Nobody else knows the details or um, what perspective you bring. You're sharing your thoughts. These aren't things like a test where there's a right or wrong. This is your perspective. Since we appreciate you making the effort to be here with us. Thank you for your time. I did not think I'd be here sitting telling you that, hey, I got you. Giving testimony right does not guarantee passage or failure of legislation, but it could influence months. one or more committee uh, members, and that may be enough to determine the outcome. I think, and this is something that any of us who are trying to be persuasive in any facet of our life, um, what we're trying to do is get a message across and persuade somebody to see it our way. And I think the most important part of that is to be really clear on what you think is the most persuasive point you can make and how you can make it. And keep it simple. Try to identify what the problem is and what it is you would like legislators to do about it. it. It's not just good enough to get up there and say, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. How do you want legislators to help solve that problem? If, if you're prepared, um, if you hit a few key points, and if, you're, uh, and if you can make it personal, you've got an effective presentation. A legislator may not walk in your shoes. We don't have your experiences. We don't have your perspective. And that's what we're looking for from you. Um, we want you to share with us how laws, bills affect your life. The Capitol grounds are filled with memorials to people and events, but there's a memorial that was placed here in 2016 that is to the workers of Minnesota. What's the story behind this memorial? Dave Rowe envisioned this from the very start, um, well back into the early 90s. And Dave Rowe is a union. He was a union. He was president of AFL-CIO okay. for a num number of years. Um, he's since died uh, just two years ago. He had an idea for an interpretive center. Um, when that one went by the wayside, we convinced them to do a memorial instead, um, eliminating all the needs for personnel and such. So we chose this site. Um, originally we had just a blank wall, but we knew there was going to be some artwork on it. Um, so it was going to be a garden because uh, we've got three, eventually we have three gardens along Cedar Street here. We have the women's suffrage garden and then we have the workers garden. And so we put in the garden and we had a blank wall. Um, and then in, six, uh, in 15, we chose an artist who does mosaics, and uh, Craig David, he's a West Sider, he's done a number of mosaics on the West Side. He came up with some concepts that we said, let's make it somewhat metaphorical, but Minnesotan, clearly Minnesotan. And the whole idea was to represent all workers, not just union, but all workers, housewives, teachers, um, daycare providers, uh, bricklayers, all the carpenters and trades and stuff like that. But we didn't want to get so specific so that you'd have to make sure you included everyone or they'd be offended. So it was meant to be metaphorical. Um, and so The he, idea being that everybody could find themselves exactly, somewhere in the mosaic. Exactly, exactly. And so he did several sketches and then the one that we chose, um, the committee chose, uh, as you see, has a, sun, has a sun rising over a lake. It has a uh, river represented with two cities. It has the farm fields. It has uh, forests, it has agricultural, it has Lake Superior with the, with the ore boat. And so he laid that out in his studio down in Zumbro Falls. He had a 40 foot long act, uh, life size piece and then he cut all the pieces and everything, reassembled it up here. Um, so it represents um, obviously all the different uh, uh, trades and 
uh, workers over time. It's got um, Mayo represented with the medical. It has press represented with a newspaper and camera. It has someone that is a singer and because of the colors, someone when they first got it up here said, oh, Prince. Right. Even though it wasn't intended to be Prince. Uh, they have a bridge that it takes a whole village to re hold it up. They've got one construction worker with a hard hat and then a, a woman and then a number of people holding up the other end, spanning the river. So again, the incorporation of all kinds of people, all different workers. Um, and it has, on the two ends, it has uh, mourning scenes, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, with Native Americans mourning those who died because there are numbers who died on the job. Then it has a quote from Langston Hughes, a quote from Hubert Humphrey um, that was taken from the, uh, his speech at the AFL-CIO about having tears. Uh, it has the dedication quote from Walter Mondale, and uh, Mondale in his biography joked that you usually don't get your name on a memorial in the Capitol grounds until you're dead 10 years. And he got his name. <laughs> so he got his name a little bit earlier. <laughs> Um, and he talked about this being a sacred space. He, he was here for the dedication of the wall originally, and then he was here for the rededication in 2016. On the side of the mural, there is a list of four major events that had significant loss of life in Minnesota. Why include those on this piece? Those were the four events where there were a number of lives lost all at once. Um, the Cuyuna flood, the Washburn, fire, Washburn Mill fire, uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, and the Hinckley fire. And so, and then the Hinckley fire, I mean, it was workers, it was citizens, it was women and children and everything. So those they wanted to recognize in special ways. What is the message behind this memorial? Uniquely, uh, I mean, we've had other memorials to workers, Pete, the police officers, the firefighters, the transportation workers in the DOT building. We wanted to have one that recognized all work, all workers, be it union or non-union, who have contributed to make Minnesota what it is today. Over time, through the centuries, um, whether it woman, man, whatever race, creed, whatever your job is, that you've all contributed to making Minnesota the great place it is today. This is probably one of the more visited ones other than um, the veterans memorials where a lot of the veterans come with their families in three generations because people come here, I come here and I've chosen the person with the hard hat by the bridge because I work by the Capitol, I work on construction projects and I wear a hard hat. So um, you've actually picked out a person to yes, identify yeah. with personally, and exactly. that's the message of this, that we're yeah. all supposed to be able to find ourselves in this right. mosaic. We wanted to make it somewhat abstract so that everyone can see themselves in this in some way, shape, or form. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.